Let's get in this word. Open your Bible, your Bible app, wherever you are, to Jeremiah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, that means gave you a body. The word formed actually means wound, W-M-B-E-D. In other words, before you entered flesh, I knew you. That word knew means know by experience. So I've gone in depth with this. The Bible does not speak in depth on this kind of existence. But I know I existed before I got here. Okay? People are so hung up and messed up and traumatized. And I'm not belittling it because many of it, the past can be painful. But they're hung up on whether or not they felt they were illegitimate or their mom and daddy. It was a one night stand or they were adopted. No, Let me tell you something. How you got here didn't matter because you existed before you got here. And you were so important in heaven, God just had to find a pathway to get you into the earth. And you have something to do in the earth that has no connection to you biologically. It has a connection to your life heavenly because life does not begin at conception, at birth, or wherever you lay on that spectrum. Life begins in heaven in the mind and in the heart of God. So I had experienced you. Yes, leave that scripture up if you would. John, uh, Jeremiah 1. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Sanctified means separate and other. So before I gave you flesh, I already knew you in heaven and had experienced you. And I had already made you other and separate from anybody else. So there's something in the earth that only you can do. And if you do not fulfill that assignment, it will not be done. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Lord, bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go, here we go, here we go. Y'all got any amens left in you? Are we good? Okay. Let me start right here. Just going to go straight through these scriptures very quickly. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So, before I got here, God had already had experiences with Ron Carpenter. He didn't know me by knowledge. He knew me by experience. I can tell you what an apple tastes like or I can let you bite it. In other words, he said, I know this from the taste. I know this from experience. I don't know this from knowledge about you. So I existed with God and in God before I ever entered the earth. So in other words, my purpose and my destiny was planned beforehand. And so God has given me a span of time called a lifetime that I can fulfill the purposes of God within that time. Okay? Now, if I was here before I got here, let's go back. In the beginning was the Word. Now, there are three that testify in heaven. Are you ready? You better remember this. Make me look like a good teacher. Three that testify in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So the Godhead is made up of the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Not the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Son is His earthly name. Word is His eternal name. So there are three that testify in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? He was in the beginning with God. So we got who, we got where, we got when. I'm throwing this out quick. I'm going to be in the car today driving home. I'm going to say, you did a lot. Told him a lot. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Okay? Now, in the beginning was word, and everything came from word. Let me get prophetic. Nothing happens until you speak. Nothing. Everything comes from word. Your life follows your word. Some of you don't like where you are. I can promise you if I heard your conversation, you've talked yourself all the way there. Joyce Meyer has a famous book called Hung by the Tongue. In your Mouth, the tongue is the power of life. 
You take concepts, dreams, and visions, but they are inside of you until you speak them. When you speak them, you're giving life to spiritual things that they may manifest in the earth realm. Nothing that has been made was made without word. So in the beginning was word. So if it's been made, that's where it came from. <clears throat> Are we all on the same page? We've gone into this in depth, those of you visiting, okay? Next verse, go to 12 through 14. Same chapter, going down a few verses. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name. Powerful verse right here. Those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man. Quit being hung up on how you got here. It didn't have anything to do with the will of blood or the will of flesh or the will of man. It had to do with being born of God. Your life didn't begin here. Your life didn't begin with your past. Your life didn't begin with your biological mother and father. Your life began because you were born out of the will of God. You were born out of God. Now that is a powerful statement because it makes people feel uncomfortable because that which is of goat is goat. That which is of tiger is tiger. That which is of tomato is tomato. That which is of squash is squash. And that which is of God, you are born of God. You are royalty. You are sons of the most high God. He has birthed you by his seed. The seed of Jesus lives on the inside of you. And that's why he has put his potential on the inside of you. That the very things he did, greater works shall ye do. <laughs> because you were born out of word. Okay. And the word became flesh. And dwell among us. Be careful how you talk because words always become flesh. <laughs> and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Talking about Jesus. The word became Jesus. The angels announced and he shall be God with us. You shall call him Emmanuel. God with us. The word flesh. Okay, so in the beginning was the word and everybody who has been born again, he gave the right to be his children because they've been born of God. I just read it. Next verse, can we go deeper? First John five. Well, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. I'm gonna come back to you and give you another chance. I'm going over here. I'm preaching to the love. Is there any love over here on this side? Okay, there we go. I'm not mad at you. We cool. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Not born of flesh, not born of blood, nor of the will of man, but born of God. That which is born of God overcomes the world. The world is not out there. First John chapter two and verse 15 said, these three are in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I am fighting not things around me, I'm fighting things in me. The thing in you, if it is not conquered, will create the mess that is around you. For out of the heart flow the issues of life. Your heart creates your issues, not your devil. How did I get here? This is a mess. I, I bind the devil in Jesus. You bind in the wrong devil. <laughs> Go look in the mirror and bind that one. That's the one you need to bind. <laughs> the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These three are in the world. And the Bible says, and the lust of those fade. That's why a marriage based on covenant love of God can last forever. But you get married out of lust, I told you last week, you'll wake up one morning and say, ooh, I'm sick of you. It fades and you gotta move on to the next one. And guess what? It fades. And then you move on to the next one. And the more you chase, the emptier you get. They fade. Seen people, I gotta have that car, I gotta have that car until about the third payment. 
that, that shine fades. <laughs> Just the way. Ain't it amazing how true the Word of God is? Isn't it? It's amazing. It's amazing things pinned eternally thousands of years ago are dropped right in our closet today and have relevance. Okay? For he who is born of God overcomes the world. These are the world the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So when you are born of God, you have been given the power to overcome you. Okay? Now, I'm building this thing right here, and then I'm going to go into some really good stuff. I'm going to skip something. All right. So that my wife don't fuss at me today. Are we good? Raise your hand if you've got it up to right there. You've got it. Okay, I'm not going to go back there and recap anymore. That's it. I'm going somewhere totally new from here on out. Okay? All right. Ephesians 2.20. Uh, at least never say my pastor breaking it down. He's breaking it down. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It didn't say you would, but you should. And whether or not you walk it out will not be up to God. It'll be up to you. The Bible says that your days were written in a book before one of them came to be. So God has already written a book with your name on front of it called the life of and insert your name right there. And all of your days have already been written. That is why we've got to change the way we pray and the way we approach God. Because we pray like we want God to move. God has already moved. Jesus has already said it is finished. So God has already set out your days and then Jesus has finished the work to make sure that you have the righteousness and the legal power to go and possess everything that God has prepared for you. It's all done and it's all finished. So some of us like, I need God to move in my life. I need God to move. You don't need to move God. God's trying to move you. In other words, he's already prepared it, but he's got to take you out of it and take you into the next thing. Take you out of the last thing, take you into the next thing. God's not about to move. God's about to take you into something that he's already prepared. How many of you like knowing that it's already there waiting on you? God's already prepared it and he ain't got to get up and do something for me today. It was here waiting on me when I got here. Somebody shout hallelujah. Yay! Ah. All right, let me go here. Now you're getting into my, this is my stuff I teach pastors. I'm going to pull out of it, then I'm going to give it to you. You are his workmanship. Your life was prepared and laid out before you got here. You should walk in it. But you were created in Christ. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. <clears throat> Some of you have been in church forever. That's funny. There's other people in here like, really? <laughs> Christ describes his function. Like if you say, Ron is my pastor. Okay, pastor's not my last name. But pastor describes my function for and to you and the relationship that I have to you. He is Jesus who functions as the Christ. The word Christ means anointing. Say that, anointing. Everybody needs to know that word. The anointing is descriptive of the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you, which was the intent of Jesus. I get frustrated and amazed and mystified at churches that are content with just bringing you to the cross. 
Because the cross is not a landing spot, it's an entry point. Jesus self-described himself as a door. What is a door? It's a place of entry. There is a kingdom life for you. But you have to walk through Jesus, the door. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. He is the initial experience. Why? Because the goal of Jesus was that you be filled with the spirit that filled him. That's what it means to be anointed. After Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, he came up, the heavens opened up, and the Spirit of God descended on him in bodily form like a dove. The next words out of Jesus' mouth, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. We didn't hear anything about an anointing for 30 years. Then when the Holy Spirit came and rested on him, he said, now I'm anointed. The whole goal of Jesus was to remove the sin, baptize you in water so that the dove can come. You are supposed to get up every morning full of the Spirit, living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, the Spirit talking to you, the Spirit giving you insight, the Spirit giving you discernment, the Spirit giving you words of wisdom, the Spirit giving you words of knowledge, the Spirit giving you supernatural faith. All these things are yours. And when I will not talk about the Holy Spirit, I deprive you of this entire adventure and journey that God has purposed you to live. And it frustrates me when preachers won't go there anymore. How dare me withhold that from you? The Holy Spirit is the only one who knows your assignment. (laughs) Thank God for motivational speakers, but Tony Robbins don't know your assignment. (laughs) The Holy Spirit knows your assignment. I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to have that place on the West Coast, I mean East Coast. I know I'm supposed to have a ministerial fellowship. I know, why? Because the Holy Spirit told me. Not because I went and paid for somebody to motivate me. I know the thing, so I get up every day. Do I get up every day just walking on clouds? Do I get up every day and don't ever feel bad? Do I get up every day and never? No, but I get up every day with purpose because I know what the Holy Spirit has assigned me to do. (laughs) And it gives you the power to do what you need to do. Campus on the East Coast was wiped out, had to be totally restarted, but I was fine, I had energy, you know why? Because I'm in purpose. We had 5,712 people in attendance the last day before shutdown here. The day we opened up, we had 349. Went from 5,700 to 300. You don't think that messed with me? But I came here every day, energetic. I preached the 300, then the 400, then the 500, then the 600, then the 700, then the 800. Why? Because I get shaped. Because I get up with a sense of purpose on my life, and if you know God has put you there, then it don't matter if it's 5,000 or 300, you get the significance of knowing your life is making a difference and you're doing what you were called to do. I'm gonna give somebody 10 seconds to give God a radical shout, because I feel something prophetic stirring in this house right now. Yeah, come on, give him some glow. Hallelujah, hallelujah. High five your neighbor and say, live on purpose. Come on, say, live on purpose. Colossians 1. I feel this thing. Now. Man, I wish I could just read you all the context, but I'd be teaching on assignment for six years. <laughs> it's hard to just pluck scriptures out. I really don't even like doing that because when preachers don't give you the context of something, they can twist it and make it mean anything they want. So go back and test me when you go home. Read it within its context, but for the sake of time, I gotta pluck some out. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but has now been revealed. We live in a great day. Everybody from the Old Testament back 
longed and prophesied for what we live. What is this mystery? Been revealed to his saints. Next verse, please. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. There's a mystery and it is rich in substance. What is it? Rich to this mystery among the Gentiles. The Gentiles is everybody non-Jew. Okay. God loves Jewish people, but remember he came to his own and his own received him not. That's why they're praying at the wailing wall right now because they missed him. So when they, he came to his own and his own received him not, he went to non-Jew. That's us, Gentile. Okay, unless you're in here and you're Jewish. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is the anointing in you. It is our hope of glory. Adam was made in the image and glory of his God. Psalm chapter 8 says that Adam was crowned with glory and honor. Earth is a physical expression of heaven. Adam is a physical expression of God. He was built Hebrew in the imago Dei, means the image of his God. So when God was making Adam out of the dust of the earth, he was looking at himself. Okay. I'm going to go buy myself a steak. I'm preaching way above salad. Yeah, way above salad. Okay. Hallelujah. I got thinking about steak. I forgot I was really on something hot. <laughs> Adam, yeah. Adam was a physical expression of his father. Earth was a physical expression of heaven. That's why the first place in earth was called Eden, which means paradise or heaven. Okay. So God creates with word. And God said, and there was. Everything that was made was made by word and there was nothing that was made that was made. So God the Father reached over and took the word and made it through word. God Almighty. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Okay. Now, Adam was crowned with God's glory. Which means God told Adam, said, whatever you call it, that's what it is. Well, that's the way God operated. So being crowned with glory, the word glory in the Old Testament means weight, substance, and authority. So in other words, Adam would speak in the earth and God would back him up. He was crowned with glory. So Adam would call it something and heaven would get behind what he said. But Adam sinned. Skip 4,000 years to Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory. So now man speaks and the earth doesn't respond. I could go off right here. The Bible says that the earth is in the pains of childbirth like a mother. Bible says it's groaning. One scripture says it's rocking and reeling like a drunken man. It says it's awaiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Didn't say it was awaiting the second coming of Jesus. It said it was awaiting a people in the earth that are the sons of God. Then it goes on to say, who are these sons of God? Those who are led by the Spirit. These are the sons of God. The earth is waiting on anointed people who are full of the Spirit. Excuse me, it's not waiting on the Democrats, Republicans, or Libertarians. We need God. We need the people of God to get us out of the mess we in. And the earth is not waiting on a new political party. It is waiting on God's people to raise 
raise up their voice like a trumpet and let his light be shown in the darkness. Come on, somebody, shout amen. I'm trying to find a place to shut down. At least never say, give him five more minutes. Give him five more minutes. I've been preaching 30 minutes. Give me five more minutes. Woo! Now, so Adam sinned. Adam is the federal head, which means when he sinned, all sin. Romans chapter five says, when he sinned, all sin. When he died, all died. So if an Adam screws it up, it's gonna take an Adam to fix it. So Jesus is called the second Adam. <laughs> so the second Adam came to undo all the mess the first one did. So here comes Jesus as the second and the last Adam. Okay. And what do we do? And we beheld the glory. And the word became flesh and we beheld the glory. What does that mean? Jesus went around and started talking to stuff. Jesus didn't put his hands on things. He didn't go there and lay his hands on Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. He sent his word in there. And here comes this carcass. Broke fever with his words. Looked at a fig tree. May nobody ever eat from you again. Looks at the waves. Tell the wave to quit crashing. Looks at the wind and tells it to quit blowing. Finally, we're seeing what glory looks like. That's the way Adam was supposed to operate. But he sinned and screwed it up. So here comes Jesus. And he said, this was the way I originally intended for you to function. That everything that happens will happen with your word. Ah. Look at your neighbor and say, watch your I gotta wrap this up. I gotta wrap this up. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is a mystery. How can mankind once again look like their creator? It's a mystery hidden for generations, but now revealed Christ, the anointing, the Holy Spirit living in you, the hope of fever, I command you to go right now in Jesus' name. COVID, you will not come in this household. No harm shall befall us and no sickness shall come nigh our dwelling place in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that as my son plays football tonight, I thank you that you've commanded your angels to take him up in their wings and bear them in all their ways and guard him so he does not dash his foot against the stone. So you can speak it and it will happen. <laughs> the word glory in the Old Testament is weight, substance, and authority. The word glory in the New Testament is a different word, which means likeness and resemblance. So the Holy Spirit anointing me is my hope of resembling my God. For some of you who need an analogy, let me give you one. For instance, the Bible says, y'all need to come to marriage conference to hear this. The Bible says that man is the glory of God. Okay? My friend right here, if I don't know God, if I've never been in a church, and I don't even know what a Bible is, I should be able to look at his life and know something about his God because he is the image, reflection, and glory of his God. I'm about to mess you up before I close. Now, the Bible says that woman is the glory of man. So I should be able to look at the woman and learn something about her So if your woman's mad and broken and resentful and bitter and hateful, she's the image and glory of somebody she's married to and living with. Y'all ain't saying nothing in this building. Ladies, y'all can say amen and leave me an offering right up here.
That's why I want my wife to be happy. I want my wife to be smiling. I want my wife to be beautiful. I want my wife to be served. I want my wife to feel secure. I want my wife to feel loved. Do I do it perfectly? No, but I'm making intention. Why? Because I want to say I can. Kn- I know God by watching Ron Carpenter's life, and I can tell what kind of man Ron is by watching his life. That's what the word glory means. Christ, the anointing living in you that you once again resemble and look like the God who made you. Somebody give God praise in this place. Hallelujah. Stand up with me all over this building. Woo. High five two people say live on purpose. God is doing something in this church. I can feel it stirring. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. May God establish you and give you peace in Jesus' mighty, matchless name. And everybody said amen. Go have the best Sunday you've ever had. I love you and I'll see you next week.